champions to the stage, so if you guys want to go ahead and make your way up, both, uh, both panels will present, um, before we start the first panel, I want to present the champions to you guys as a group. sufficiently dry so so I'm just gonna I'd love to read off the names and especially the folks um, uh, where you're from so I'm gonna start with Brad Baker from Jonesboro Arkansas Dr. Paul Berman from Hillsdale New Jersey Mike Buscemi from Thornville Ohio Carla Harris from South Milwaukee, Wisconsin. Greg Jeffrey from North Webster, Indiana. And Robert Massoff from Pasadena, Maryland. And we have Nadine Nishioka from Honolulu, Hawaii. Laura Reed from Portsmouth, Virginia. Portsmouth, Virginia. And then we have, uh, sorry, I skipped, uh, Emmy Nis, 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 Nis Neon. I think I said that right. And Doug Rodenbeck from Fort Wayne, Indiana. And Debbie Whittlesey from Lebanon, Missouri. So second panelist, you guys can exit and then we'll get started with our first panel. Thank you. And I want to wear, welcome Eric back to the stage, who's going to lead um, lead our first panel um, as a moderator. Uh, we are hoping that um, first, um, maybe each of you could just um, give everybody here in the room and also um, watching a, a little description for a couple of minutes about some of your activities and, and what hap what's happening in your, your club and in your community. So maybe we could just go right down the road. Okay. Uh, my name is Doug Rodenbeck and I was the Indiana State LEO chairman um, and also uh, I'm currently uh, a member of the in uh, International LEO Advisory Panel. Uh, our big project in the LEOs was the uh, burn suites, the family suites, which we built at the St. Joe Regional Medical Center. The Leos found out that there was a great need for uh, a place of refuge for people who had family members in critical condition in the burn unit. Uh, the galvanizing story for that was there was a, a teenage boy who was there for 72 days and uh, he uh, was in uh, medically induced coma for a lot of that time and the family of course didn't want to leave his bedside uh, generally the family members don't want to when they're, they're that bad off they don't want to go blocks away at a hotel in case something might change so um, the problem that one of the problems that occurred with that was that his younger brother ended up sleeping on the floor next to his brother's bed and that kind of made people start to think, gee, maybe we ought to have a place of refuge for these people, a place where they could be right near them. So we talked about converting an area in the hospital that would have uh, some sleeping rooms, a living area, kitchen area, laundry facility, and a business area. And uh, I asked the Leos if they wanted to lead the fundraising drive on that. And they immediately took out and went all over the state of Indiana making presentations. And we ended up in a year and a half uh, raising $170,000 <coughs> $170, for that project. And it has been successfully uh, uh, operating for the last year and a half. And to give you an idea of how that impacts people, uh, we had one letter of thank you from uh, lady who, uh, whose husband was in the burn unit and the thank you simply said I don't have an end address anymore our house blew up thank you for letting me stay there wow. 
Thank you, Eric. <coughs> Excuse me, I'm carrying a sore throat today. Uh, but I really don't want to pass up this opportunity because it's uh, kind of rarefied air when I think of champions sitting up here and I look out at the people I know in this audience. It is it's truly a two-way mirror. And uh, this is really, really an opportunity, uh, uh, I think, for us to uh, celebrate together the enormous and incredible work of Lions on the national and the international scale. So thank you very much. I'm honored and I'm humbled and uh, really delighted to be part of this group. Um, multiple District 13K is a very typical, a very typical multiple district. We're involved in most of those things that really relate to our, our everyday living in, in communities in Ohio. Very involved in youth work, not only Lions Quest, Project Good, uh, we have a youth camp. Uh, we're involved in disaster relief, and we're very diligent about that. I happen to be, just coincidentally, involved in the Thornville Lions Club, which is the best club uh, in the district, which is the best district in the state, which happens to be the best district in the country. So it's, it's very coincidental indeed. Uh, in, in, in terms of representing youth, I, I, again, it just it blows my mind and always has. I wanted to be a teacher since I was in the fifth grade, uh, and I even wanted to be more involved in youth work since I taught emotionally delinquent youth at the seventh grade level. Um, I was in a classroom that had a red telephone next to my desk because these kids were so distressed, so distraught, so unleveled in terms of their living uh, style at age 13 and 14 that it was incomprehensible. So we knew something had to be done in terms of dealing with kids like this at every level. So my involvement in Lions Quest uh, started in 1982. Uh, and as a recovering teacher, uh, I just couldn't be prouder. Uh, today, uh, I'm proud to say we have reached since 1982 because of your work. I've been a very, very small cog in this very, very big wheel, trust me. Uh, but we have reached, uh, grasped this, in excess of 12 million students and still are with the skills and the tools and the attitude to make positive, healthy decisions. So when you read the paper and you hear about the 25%, don't forget the 75% that you're reaching every day doing the hard work through programs like Lion's Quest in the school system. 74 countries, 35 languages, with half a million teachers in every country, um, almost every country doing our work. So thank you again. district governor and a disaster right at the end of my year, a 14 mile long EF5 tornado coming through uh, basically my backyard. Uh, the tremendous uh, stress that that caused, uh, wondering what, what to do, what are we going to do. Immediately I had over 200 phone calls from you all, from the Lions. I shouldn't have been surprised. Uh, Lions were rushing in with phone calls, money, uh, requests to, to s help in any way they saw possible, and that's just what Lions do across the world. And um, we had immediate access within 24 hours. Less than 24 hours, we knew we had $10,000 coming from LCIF, so we were able to immediately mobilize and create energy packs with energy drinks. Uh, we had energy bars, trail mix, things with substance. We knew we were in excessive heat. Uh, the people were going through trying to find something that belonged to them that was precious that maybe they did not lose in the tornado. The lions, we went out into the area. We brought uh, those much needed supplies along with leather gloves, sunscreen, anything we could think of that we thought um, would be handy or helpful to the people in the area. Having the money available like that, 
to get to our neighbors was extremely important. There were seven of our own lions in Joplin that lost their homes. And so uh, I do have to brag on those lions. Some of those lions that lost their homes were there at the Lions Club building, grilling hamburgers with us and taking uh, food out to, to those devastated. Uh, one of the things that I'm most proud of is our partnership with the First Response Team of America. Through that partnership, the Lions, all of us, were able to turn about $70,000 into a million dollars worth of cleanup for free for the people of Joplin, Missouri. They knew the Lions were there. We're still there today. A project we're working on right now is um, Irving Elementary is going to be built at the place of the hospital site. And it's, it's our goal as Lions, or it's my goal, I think we're going to do this. <laughs> well, I see Lions, they, they are given a challenge and they meet, not only meet it, they exceed it. We were supposed to plant a million trees, we planted 15 million trees. Um, lions are going to plant trees on Irving Elementary, every tree there. It's going to be about 25,000 to do that. We've already got 10,000. So um, a, almost a year and a half later, Lions, we're still there. We're still working hard, and I couldn't be more proud to be here today representing all of you. Hello, or aloha. Aloha. <laughs> uh, I'm Nadine Nishioka. I'm from the Honolulu Manoa Waioli Lions Club, and I just honestly have to say that I alone am not the champion of the environment. If it were not for the Lions of Hawaii, there would be no champion of the environment because someone asked me the other day, do you have environmental problems in Hawaii? Well, if you don't notice it, that means the Lions of Hawaii are doing a fantastic job. <laughs> so, you know, so I just have to give kudos to the Lions of Hawaii, all of us. So, but um, at this time, actually, I would like to share with you that the Lions of Hawaii do other things because I will definitely talk about the environment. But this week in Hawaii right now, we have something going on called SOS Week, and it's called Seven Days of Service. And I'm actually the chair of that week, this week, and it started Sunday. So I've been on the phone back and forth saying, they're like, let it go, you're fine. We're doing fine. So, and I truly believe they're carrying on. This past Sunday, we had a Lions Foundation walk, over 300 people on every island. We had a walk. And what's special, and I want to share this with all of you, what's special about that is that the money raised goes for vision and hearing screenings for the state of Hawaii. The state no longer does vision and hearing screenings for school children because they have no funding. So children have, um, excuse me, the Lions have stepped up to the plate, so to speak, and we perform as many vision and hearing screenings as we can throughout the state. And we have on-site lions who are optometrists and audiologists who are there to give professional opinions. And I want to share a personal story with you, which gives you a lot of insight to the great job all of us do as lions. I went to a hearing screening, and there was this one young girl. She was standing in a corner by herself. And I asked the teachers, why is she there by herself? And they said, well, she's a special ed student, so we, she doesn't really participate in a lot of these other things. Um, she gets excited. So I said, well, you know, she should participate as a, a member of the student body. So they would talk to her and they'd ignore her. Then I heard her humming a Japanese song. So I went up to her and I spoke to her in Japanese. And she looked at me and, tr and I could tell she was watching my lips. And so she would turn away. But then I would touch her and speak to her in Japanese again and she would look at my lips. So I brought her over to the hearing uh, testing area and I put earphones on her. And you know what happened? She's hearing impaired. She's not special ed. So to this day, she is using hearing aids and she's among her peers at the elementary school and Lions did that. So I'm very proud of that. So, so, I, just wanted to, so I just wanted to share that with you because all over the world we're doing a lot of good and I would definitely talk about how Lions are saving the environment in Hawaii. Thank you.
uh, as social worker um, teachers and assistant teachers, we all work together um, to meet the needs of the children at our four preschool centers. Um, and because we have lines at each school, it helps us to be aware of what the needs are so we can be responsive to those needs. So we have provided um, glasses, hearing aids, excuse me, <coughs> adaptive equipment uh, for playgrounds, and we even sponsored uh, an Eagle Scout who built an adaptive playground for two and three year olds with special needs. Um, but our newest project is the one that we're most excited about, and that one is concerning literacy and language development. And um, what we want to do is we've partnered with a local shelter in Portsmouth, and we're working with another agency that works with early childhood um, with early childhood families in their home. And we're providing books for them and also language extension activities. So we're teaching the parents how to be teachers and raising their confidence in, in um, teaching their children to not only enjoy books, but to foster language development as a whole. So that when they come to preschool, they're prepared and ready. Um, well, I know everybody in this room is not surprised by these stories because we know that um, while these are particularly special uh, champions of change, uh, we all know that this goes on around the world every day um, with every club, uh, with all the Lions Club members, and I hope folks watching um, will learn a lot about what this amazing organization does. So um, hopefully we'll have a little bit of time to talk about it. I, w I was hoping to ask uh, each panelist a little bit more about um, some of the things they mentioned, and then if we have time, maybe talk a little bit more generally about things like service and volunteerism. Um, Doug, when, when you were describing your programs and everything, you, you mentioned something called Leo Clubs, and I know the, the many people here know what they are, but I was hoping you could describe a little bit more uh, what is Leo Club as opposed to Lions Club, and how does it fit in to the whole service ethic of the organization? Certainly. Uh, Leos are a project of Lions Clubs International. Leos uh, range in age from, uh, the, well, the Alpha Leos are from 12 to 18, and then the uh, Omega Leos are from 18 to 30. And it's, it's an outreach program to encourage and promote and educate young people around the world in community service. And uh, we do that by offering them opportunities. Uh, the first opportunity would be the name recognition and credibility of Lions Clubs International allows them to accomplish whatever they would like for the good of their community. I tell them this is your magic wand. It's, it's your ability to change your community for the better as you would like to do it. Also the resources of Lions can, can become a, a, a big uh, project. We had one club, uh, the Portage Middle School Club, which is sponsored by my club, Anthony Wayne Lions, they were going to hold a chicken barbecue, and uh, unfortunately it rained on that day, and the advisor called up and said, the faculty advisor, and said, what am I going to do? And I said, no problem, I happen to know that your sponsoring club has a tent, and they made one call, the club came out and put up a tent, and it enabled them to raise $3,500 for their school, which was the largest uh, fundraiser that that junior high school had ever had. According to the um, Mike, you also uh, mentioned a term that maybe not everyone who's watching would be familiar with, because you mentioned um, Lions Quest. So, could you could you describe that a little bit and um, and how that fits into the overall initiatives that you guys are doing in your um, was it MD thirteen? MD thirteen, right. Um, Lions Quest, um, not dissimilar to Dunn's project, it is a project of Lions Clubs International. Uh, started in 1984, it was a, it was a project uh, of the Board of Trustees at that time uh, of Lions, uh, a very, very um, firm decision to become intricately involved in the drug prevention issue, in this country particularly and worldwide eventually. 
uh, and it, uh, it really approached the issue of drug prevention from a holistic perspective, which you would certainly uh, understand, Eric, in your work. But uh, the determination was made, and, and the reason it's lasted 30 years, that drug prevention in and of itself is not the issue. It's not drugs per se, not violence, not bullying. It's, it's a people problem. And if programs were going to be integrated into the school, they needed to be people savvy. And so we worked with the W.K. Kellogg Foundation, the Lions Clubs International Foundation, uh, Reader's Digest Association, and developed a program that was really built on the, soldier, the shoulders of research at that time. It's a K-12 based, K-12 curriculum that relies heavily on integrating the community, the parents in the school, because research is so firm about that. And, uh, and, and that program was so desperately needed, it became national within six months, international within 12 months, and, and basically because the needs of kids are universal. You don't separate a child's head from a child's heart, and unless you really approach the issues of, of uh, children holistically, you're really not going to have much luck. Bullying approached at the seventh grade level is going to be less than effective. Drug prevention, etc. So. Uh, Lion's Quest it has really become a very, very successful a product of, of what we know works in best practice. And it's, uh, it's attracted the, uh, uh, the acclaim and the attention of most federal and most international organizations at this point. So, uh, yes. Thank you very much. Um, Debbie, um, you know, well, I was hoping we could learn from you because, um, you know, you describe the incredible outpouring of energy and effort to help the people um, after the tornado. Um, once the cameras leave and the immediate crisis is gone, then sometimes things um, sort of start to fade away a little bit. Could you could you give all of us some lessons learned and tips about how you maintain the the effort in things? Because we, we know that um, you know. It may be a year and a half ago, but there's still lots of things, as you described one example, lots of things um, that need to be done. What are the ways to really keep the momentum going? Well, I think I'm glad you asked that question because um, we're, we're already, all of us Lions, we, we're already there. We're already in position. We're, this is, you know, when something like this happens in our communities, we're already home. And this is our family. And it's very easy to keep the momentum because uh, we truly care about the people that are affected. Um, lions generally are very compassionate people, and uh, we don't walk away because we're already home. So it's easy to continue. If our ocean is not beautiful, the tourists and visitors and even locals will not go. And there goes the viability of our state. So lions come together, and we. The city does not have the resources to do, to do it all. There's literally thousands of drains. So lions get together and we do a, a, a block or two of drains on any given day. And it's a great time for fellowship. We have people coming out of their homes, other organizations coming out. And we actually get people who want to donate money to help because they tell us, you know, we were wondering who was going to step up and help us do this. Because we do not only stencil drains on the same day we do painting over of graffiti. So we cover a lot of things because not only natural environment, but environmentally friendly to your eyes. So if there's graffiti, we paint it over and we clean stream beds. We clean whatever it takes to make the environment beautiful, both with your eyes and in our ocean so that you can visit us and always remember a beautiful Hawaii because the lines of Hawaii are helping to save the environment. So, um, Laura, you don't have to be nervous because you did a great job um, in your introduction. And um, may maybe you could describe in a little greater detail, you, you talked about adaptive equipment and things like that. What, what Can you describe a little bit more what, what that is and, and why it's needed? Well, um, playgrounds need to fit the children that are meant to play on them. And two, three-year-olds are much smaller than you know a 10-year-old or a four-year-old. But they also have different sensory needs. Um, for example, children with autism sometimes benefit from bouncing or jumping. So um, we purchased a, a trampoline with padding around the side so it's safer in there. 
um, or things that swing back and forth are really calming and, um, and good for them. Fantastic, fantastic. Yeah. Um, so um, as luck would have it this morning, I was at uh, another event in Washington where they brought together youth from all over the world and um, they, they're there to talk about their projects um, in service and things that they're trying to do to better the community. And um, you, you see the energy and the entrepreneurialism of those folks. Um, you all have um, years and years of experience. And I, I was hoping that um, um, I could toss one question to, and maybe you all could speak to it. It's, it's two parts. One is, um, how, how do you encourage people to service? I mean, they, they could, they have a lot of choices in their lives and people are really, really busy, but um, what are some of the ways that you encourage people to service and, and what do people most frequently say their, the rewards are from that? So that's one. And then, um, and then the second is, as they get involved then in, in service, you know, what are some of the lessons learned about what works and what doesn't, because some people get discouraged, frankly, and they may not necessarily see results right then and there. And what are some of the lessons learned to keep keep the momentum going and 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 encouraging and achieving change the way all of you have with your clubs and and everybody else here in the audience? So maybe if we uh, just uh, go down the row and starting with Doug, and you could speak to to those two things. Yes, I, uh, that's, that's a good question for me because, ironically, I, I told you I got into I'm the uh, state LEO chairman from Indiana, or was up until this last month, and um, I got into that uh, because I was encouraged by another champion of change who will be on the next panel, Greg Jeffrey, and uh, he uh, arranged to send me to a conference which was again, ironically, at the very place where we had our reception the other night, where this conference was held, and the, the main thing I learned at that conference, it was a conference on how to run successful organizations, and it was co-sponsored by the Lions, and the main thing that they, they said in that was that successful programs are run by people who are enthusiastic about their, their program and show it. You've, you've, got to, you've got to live it, breathe it, you've got to accept it in your heart. And I, I found that that works in the LEO program, and I've used that, that model, and uh, it's been very successful for us. As far as keeping people <coughs> uh, enthused, success breeds success. Uh, I, have, uh, I have one LEO club that is made up entirely of blind students, and uh, they, uh, in addition to going all around the state, they have their own van, and they'll go anywhere in the state and make presentations for you. And in addition to that, they've raised $12,000 in one year for cancer research. Okay. And every one of those students is blind. Um, I've got another, another uh, the Sharing Hearts Leo Club. Um, they, their annual Christmas project alone is between eight and, and $12,000 every year just on that one project. Success breeds success. Okay, thank you. Mike, your thoughts? There's <clears throat> certainly a lot of study on that today, and, and the field of service learning, as it's called, is pretty robust. And there, there are a set of disciplines that, that students can be taught and should be taught. I, I think two quick answers, though, to your question. One is modeling. I think Doug is sort of referring to that in some ways, that unless they see their peers, their parents, their brothers, and their sisters, uh, honoring the ethic of service, they're less likely to be involved, and certainly the earlier, the better. But in terms of Lion's Quest, there's a very, very specific response to that, and that is we begin early to make young people comfortable with themselves, learn the art and the skills of empathy, uh, social responsibility, personal responsibility, communication, and then to see a picture bigger than themselves. There's a lot of exciting research that shows that young people in the middle high school level who get involved in something bigger than themselves, nursing or teaching or doing some shadowing of professions, are much more likely to be involved. They get better grades, oftentimes they go into that profession, oftentimes service becomes part of their life, and of course that's what we're hoping for in Lions, that they see that vision early and, and, and often. So it can be taught, 
it, it done, it's not magical. And, and experience in doing it again and again, I think, is part of that for me. We, we see that. And it's uh, today there's a workshop, two workshops, going on in New York City, the Lions Quest, the largest school district in our country. And uh, they're committed to that. They, it's all the problems they have, they see the young people committing to service as one of the way out of it. So it's the most exciting stuff. Probably telling our stories, the individual people and lives that we touch, we all have stories. And um, just like the, the older gentleman that walked to the Lions Club building and he and his wife were living in someone's garage and they've been eating, eating out of a can, uh, they had no car, their car, their home was completely gone, but he walked down to the Lions Club building to get a hamburger and he was too exhausted from the heat and uh, driving him I think, first of all, when you want, um, you know, you want people to serve, you have to remember that they're all volunteers, and you have to respect them as volunteers, even as lions. So I really do think that service begins at home in your own club. If you can't get members of your own club to serve, it would be really difficult to get members outside the community to follow your lead, because as has been mentioned, you should lead by example. So in our clubs back in Hawaii, what we do is we find things that members are passionate about and they in turn will get other people passionate in the community to serve and we do things in the parks we, we pour concrete and we, we lay sod where it's necessary to build gardens because there's a dirt pathway between a, two gyms and it was awful to look at it wasn't environmentally friendly so we have members in our club who raise flowers and so we said would you like to lead making a garden and these were members who maybe weren't as active, but all of a sudden became active, brought in new members because now they found a passion. So I think when you talk about service, you need to talk about things that you yourself can relate to, something that you are passionate about and something that you believe in. And when I say believe in, I not only believe that we only think about lions and only lions, I think that we should respect other organizations and work alongside other organizations. Um, in Hawaii, we work alongside the Hawaii Red Cross with their hats off, and during it's part of our uh, seven days of service by helping the food bank, etc. And it ends this week Saturday with a <coughs> statewide food drive. Last year, we raised over six thousand dollars and almost ten thousand pounds of food statewide, and we're working on that again come this Saturday statewide. And so, I think if you can get your own members to serve with pride, the community community can rally around you and also serve with pride. Maybe they wouldn't qualify for 
special education services in the first place um, if they have that background. Because really it's 97% of the children who qualify for early childhood special ed services are because they have a language delay. And a language delay affects all other areas of development. Thank you. So um, I want to make sure that we leave time for the next panel. But um, uh, you know, picking up on something that Mike said, um, um, he was talking about modeling, and I think, um, and, and also people were talking about telling stories, and you all kindly shared the stories of your work and that of your districts and your clubs. And I think that's part of um, the reason why um, President Obama and Mrs. Obama are so enthusiastic about trying to do events like these, because really, um, you are modeling uh, not only for Lions Club, but you're really modeling for um, everybody in the United States about how we as citizens can help each other. And um, these, these are just amazing um, stories and service and, and reaching out to others. So I, I would just like to salute all of you and your clubs and your members um, for everything that you're doing, that you're modeling, and for sharing your stories with everybody in the room and those watching through the internet, uh, all the wonderful things that you're doing. So thank you very, very much. tell you a little bit about uh, my office and I think it talks to us about how times have changed. Um, I'm a grandfather of four children. I'm also the father of two six-year-olds, Sally and Daisy. Um, when my three older children were going through school, um, things were much different than the way they are now. Um, and just a, a slight uh, tangent, when I told uh, uh, Daisy was talking to me the other day about where I worked and I told her and she, went, and she asked me, trying to figure out where, where is my office, she said, Daddy, where exactly is the apartment of education? <laughs> and, you know, it, it has a nice ring to it. Um, we're, we're in the White House now. I might want to kind of uh, uh, convey that to, uh, uh, to some important people. but. Um, my office deals with a range of issues, and uh, uh, just cataloging them and listing them gives you some idea of what uh, we're all dealing with and what your students and grandchildren and children uh, are dealing with every day. Um, my office deals with bullying. It deals with school shootings. It deals with human trafficking, um, drug and substance abuse, um, teen dating violence. The, the, the list of, uh, of issues that educators, um, parents, students deal with every day is, uh, is daunting. That you all are out there in your communities with the work that you do is a great comfort to us. I, I, I send my sincere regards from Secretary Duncan, um, who knows what you do. Um, we're very familiar with Lions Quest, and it was described uh, uh, very nicely in the previous panel and, and the work that you do to assist school systems to work with communities um, is critically important these are these are issues that will not be solved by one part of our community um, these are issues that will require parents teachers uh, uh, folks in uh, our religious communities folks who uh, who work in businesses uh, uh, to work together um, we uh, we have to include everyone and uh, uh, so um, I'm very anxious. I, I, I read a little bit about uh, all of you and, and just admire your work. And um, I, I want to thank you all on, on behalf of uh, the administration, the Department of Education, for the contribution that you make. Um, we, s <laughs> we see you all as very important partners. Um, we need all the partners we can get. Um, we're all in this together. We all have the same goal of helping our children uh, uh, learn as much as they can in a safe environment, in a community that, uh, uh, that everyone wants to live in and grow up in. So um, again, thank you all, and, 
And with that, I'd, I'd like to kind of uh, turn it over to the, our panelists and have them uh, uh, give a, uh, a brief, uh, if you would, uh, uh, description of what you do. And, and uh, then we'll kind of follow up with some questions. And um, uh, we'll start there. Hello. Is this working? My name is Brad Baker. I'm from Jonesboro, Arkansas. I uh, would like to take just a minute to thank you all for having us here today. Uh, we do a lot of work out in the field, and it's, it's great to be recognized for what we do. And after what I've heard this morning and, and on the first panel, gee, aren't you proud to be a lion. Goodness. Yeah. I'm with the Mid-South Lion Sight and Hearing Service, which provides comprehensive care to the sight and hearing impaired from Arkansas, Mississippi, Missouri, and Tennessee, the underinsured, the unemployed, the uninsured, and otherwise indigent people at no charge to that patient. Uh, you know, Helen Keller was just as deaf as she was blind, and she always talked about how she really would, if she had a choice, would prefer to be blind because that took her away from things, and deafness took her away from people and contact with people. So our organization covering those four states decided that we were going to do sight and hearing, and so we do comprehensive care through examinations, remedies, therapies, surgeries, and follow-up care for sight, and then also do thorough examinations and then provide hearing aids for the hearing impaired. Uh, would like to say that uh, it's a collaboration of a lot of people put together. It's a partnership made up of the University of Tennessee Health Sciences Center in Memphis with the uh, Methodist Hospital that's in Memphis with the Lions of the four state area, about 700 or so Lions clubs who, who help us and support us and refer patients to us and who provide support for us for, with leadership and funding as well as the referrals. We also uh, uh, have so many partners in the four state area with our medical teams that uh, provide their care at no charge. The physicians provide their care at no charge. The facilities provide their care at a substantial discount. And in order to continue our work, we have to have those partnerships because with their help, we're able to provide about $5 in service for every dollar that we spend on patient care. And with their help and with the Lions and with Lions Clubs International Foundation's continued support, we're able to do what our motto says, which is a miracle a day for those in need. Thank you, Brad. Dr. Berman? Hi, uh, I'm Dr. Paul Berman. Uh, I'm a proud lion for 20 years. I'm an optometrist and I'm from uh, Hackensack, New Jersey. Um, it's really humbling from 1.35 million lions that they selected. I know I speak for all of us that they selected the 11 of us. And I certainly uh, like to thank President Matt and, and Vice President uh, uh, Preston. But I'd also really like to acknowledge, it's very interesting, and I don't know how well they're all of my co-champions are leaders, but you don't see the leadership up here. And we wouldn't be with, up here without the leadership. And I look in the audience, Clem Kuziak and Everhard Lawrence and Al Brindell. And if we didn't have such great leadership, we wouldn't be able to do what we do. And there's obviously, so thank you. And there's also another group, which is uh, our support system. <laughs> we, we have great leaders. And the beauty of going to a meeting like this, I don't know if many of our fellow champions are, and it was great to just meet nice people. And lions are nice people. It's just really a great place to be. And I'd also like to acknowledge only another group that I know, I speak with my fellow uh, champions, and our support system. So our spouses, our significant others, our family, who really enable us to do what we do. And who, you know, Diane has made me the happiest married man I know. <laughs> anyway, so thank, thank all our support system. But I'd like to talk about another group that inspires me, and that's Special Olympic athletes. And, uh, when a person with intellectual di disabilities, and Nadine mentioned the story about somebody who was hearing impaired, when somebody with intellectual disabilities can't do something, they always blame it on the intellectual disability. They never say, maybe they can't see, maybe they can't hear. So there was a great void that people with intellectual disabilities weren't getting care because they just said they, don't, they just don't understand. And what we did is we did a pilot with the support of Lions that we found that 37% of special Olympic athletes need new with different classes that 66% haven't had their eyes examined in three years. 20% of these people never had an eye examination. And I'm not talking, it's no different in the United States than it is in Uganda, because these people are universally neglected. 
urban, rural, rich, poor, it really doesn't matter. And into that void, step two organizations and, and lions, uh, Special Olympics and Lions, formed the f first partnership in the history of Special Olympics, and they created the Opening Eyes program. And as a result of that program, now 98,000 Special Olympic athletes are able to see over 250,000 have had their eyes out. And there's no other, a lot of other organizations could have given us money. They could have supported us financially. But Lions have provided 8,000 volunteers to do the program, not only to fund it, but to do it. So we're able to be in 50 countries and 40 states. I don't know any other organization in the world that could do that. So when Helen Keller asked us to be the Knights of the Blind, um, and Special Olympics enable people to jump, to run, for people to cheer for them. And now with the support of Lions Club, that's going on for over 10 years, we're now able to give them the ability to see. And all of us, and, and somebody alluded to earlier, it's always about the stories, you get all these gratifying stories. And it's, it's really something that we've able, been able to correct this, and we look forward to doing more and more great things. Thank you. Good afternoon. My name is Bob Massoff. I'm a member of the Baltimore Brooklyn Lions Club. And wearing my other hat, I'm the director of the Lions Vision Research and Rehabilitation Center at the Johns Hopkins Wilmer Eye Institute. It's a great honor to be up here, but I am a representative of about 7,000 plus Lions in uh, Maryland, Delaware, and the District of Columbia, fondly known as Multiple District 22. And we have partnered uh, Lions of Multiple District 22 with the Johns Hopkins School of Medicine to develop a program that tackles the problem of low vision. Now this program's been going on for over 21 years, and when we started, the greatest generation was experiencing vision loss at a fairly high rate as a result of age-related eye disease. This is age-related macular degeneration, glaucoma, diabetic retinopathy, uh, cataract, and a number of other conditions that increase in prevalence as you get older. There is no cure for the vision loss, even though most of these diseases can be treated and controlled, but once the vision loss occurs, uh, nothing can be done to restore it. So those people have to learn to live with the visual impairments. Low vision 20 years ago was below the radar screen uh, in health, American healthcare. There were no programs. Doctors were forced to tell their patients that we've done all we can do to treat your disease. I'm afraid there's nothing more we can do for you. And patients were left to defend for themselves. The program that we put together with the Lions and Johns Hopkins had a big agenda. We had to change a lot of things. We had to uh, develop, do research to understand the problem. We had to develop new technology to help patients use the vision they have to, to, in the most optimal way. We had to develop service delivery programs so that it could be integrated into healthcare. We had to persuade Medicare to to cover low vision services, which was done as of 2002. However, I want to note that the devices that are required to achieve the ability to live independently, low vision devices, which many Lions Clubs uh, throughout the country help patients in their community pay for these devices, uh, that's not yet covered by Medicare. So we hope to persuade them to change the policy to include that as durable medical equipment. And we had to educate the public, educate healthcare professionals, educate the patients themselves and educate the patient's family about low vision. Because people with low vision and blindness can do all the same things anyone else can do. They just have to be able to do them in a different way. They have to make adaptations, adjustments to compensate for the vision loss, use sight enhancement techniques to, to uh, use, make best use of the vision they have. And there's, there's a learning process. And unfortunately, there's a stigma uh, associated with low vision and blindness. Uh, that the patients not only put on themselves, but also a stigma that occurs in the public. So the Lions of uh, Multiple District 22 have developed a major public education program. Every club in the district has been presented the program and is presenting the program and becoming local experts on low vision and blindness and helping to steer people into programs. This has been an enormously productive partnership. I'm very proud to be part of it. And as I mentioned, I'm here as a representative of that large partnership and I'm 
honored to be here. Thank you. Well, good afternoon, everybody. My name is Maria Eminis Nissan, and I, I am from Texas. I am a mother of four, and I've been with the Lions Club since 2004. I would say that I belong to a very special club because this club is made up of families working together, together with their friends and relatives. So we started small, like 40 members in 2008 and then we just grew up tremendously and this uh, lions where I belong to are very passionate about serving people we are very fond of bringing people together that's why you know where the members are coming from all walks of life professionals not professionals but we cater to everybody because we believe that everybody can do something and can create the change to make the society better. So we came up with this program, which is the Education, Health, and Community Resources Fair. At first, since I, I'm a nurse and my husband is the charter president and he's the, doc, he's the medical doctor, so we started uh, you know, screenings, simple ones, the diabetes, uh, bone density, blood glucose screening, and then it just grew tremendously and it became like, other organizations want to come and help out. So then, every year, this project became, became bigger and bigger. From four services, now we have 47 services that we are offering the people. So uh, this became like, it was once a year, and then it became twice a year, and then uh, we are being contacted to help other organizations and other uh, to help other churches organize the same thing. And what we realize and what we're doing is just we're having fun. And these people from the government, from the church, uh, from the private agency, even the business people, they became interested in helping out. So uh, last year we were able to even give 10,000 backpacks to those kids with, with no means of going, you know, buying their own stuff for school. So this this has become a great project and everyone is giving back. So um, one, one time, it, it didn't only uh, increase our membership. What it did is also, we had uh, one elderly patient that came there and he said he wasn't feeling well and his blood pressure was 200 over 120. So immediately, since we have nurses there, we send, them to the ho we send him to the hospital and his life was saved. So the impact that it made and it made us feel was tremendous. So lions are not just changing lives, we're also saving lives. Hello, my name is Carla Harris and I am from South Milwaukee, Wisconsin, the South Milwaukee Lions and the great service state of Wisconsin. And I think the lions of Wisconsin are pretty much like lions all across the world. We do what needs to be done. We're not the, we don't sit around and talk about, is that glass half empty, is that glass half full? It's like, you want the glass full, I'll make it full. You want it empty, consider it empty. We do what needs to be done. We don't create the need, we react to it. And because of my involvement with Lions, I've had the opportunity to serve in programs I never dreamed that I could serve, of, serve in. As a regular, ordinary person, you know, mother, involved in the community, just doing what I did, the Lions gave me the opportunity to do miraculous things. When else could an ordinary person give the gift of sight? How can that happen to a regular person? But it does through Lions. Through Lions, I've been involved in a variety of vision programs, done preschool screening, eye screening, corneal tissue transporting, taken the cooler box with corneal tissues and handed them to the surgical staff and have them say, thank you, someone's going to see tonight. That's what Lions are. That's what lions do. 
and through Lions, we've all had that opportunity. I think everybody sitting in the audience has had the opportunity to give more than they thought they would. Have you had the opportunity to give more than you thought you would? Yes. Have you gotten back more than you've ever given? You betcha, as we say in Wisconsin, you betcha. That's what we do. And not only corneal tissue transporting, but I've had a chance to do eye missions to Mexico to give glasses, to put glasses on a man, an 80-year-old man who hadn't been able to read the newspaper in 15 years. Walked away from that mission able to see and read his newspaper and lead a productive life. Lions do amazing things. And I think through days like this, partnering with each other and with other organizations, we're able to spread the word. And that's been another one of my little projects with Lions, is trying to get the word out, spread the word on what Lions do. And I was very, I was just really lucky to be involved in the Lions rap video. Uh, it's a great way to get our message out to do what it takes to spread the word of Lions and to let other people know that they can be involved. So people who are watching this out in cyberspace somewhere in the world will be able to know that they can join Lions, that they can be a member of Lions Club, that they can get out, give the gift of sight, do some of these miraculous things that we've heard about today. They can sit at this table. There's plenty of room at this table for anyone because Lions are champions of change. We all serve, we all change lives, and I think all of us have had our lives changed because of what we do with lions. So lions, we give the gift of sight, but we get those life-changing gifts in return. So I, I thank you all for inviting me here, and thank you all for what you do. I'm Greg Jeffrey, and I'm proud to be a lion. I'm proud to be with you today and share the story of our international eye care missions that we have a tradition of doing for over 30 years. We, our founder, Pest District Governor Bill Truby, first recruited me to go on an eyeglass mission in the mid-90s when he found out that I spoke fluent Spanish. And at this point, let me address some of the audience here and on the internet that I know are watching. Hola, mis com compañeros leones in la America Central. I said hello to my friends, fellow lions in Central America who are tuning in on the internet. But once that was found out, I was more than happy to serve, knew nothing about what an eyeglass mission was about. But on my first mission, I learned a lesson that I carry forward to today. And that is, as, as just was mentioned by Carla, one of the best gifts that we have, and I've been told this by many of those who do it on our missions, is putting that pair of eyeglasses on a person's face and seeing their reactions and hearing the thank yous. Those reactions sometimes are very jubilant, sometimes are very tearful. Other times we have prayers said on our behalf that we were sent there to restore their sight. This gives us much more to come home with than we ever left with. Let me outline a typical mission for you very briefly. Our missions are, are somewhat com complex compared to a typical eyeglass mission. We not only take 20,000 pairs of recycled eyeglasses on a typical mission and 45 team members, but included in that 45 team members are usually five optometrists four ophthalmologists, and other volunteers that we use to dispense the eyeglasses that we have collected over a one-year period and had prepared for us through the Westville Correctional Facility using inmates that have been trade, trained as opticians. This is a Lions project that we're very proud of, and the impact that we have on people's lives changes our lives for the better and inspires us to do more. We will continue the work we do as Lions as long as there is a need in Central America. We have plans to outreach to other countries in the Caribbean as time goes on. A typical mission costs approximately $12,000 
for the Lions Clubs, nearly 60 in our uh, district of the nine northeastern Indiana counties to put on each, time, each year. And we're able to raise those funds between those clubs and with private donations. We're going to continue that work, as I said. We, we have expanded beyond just the eye examination and the ophthalmology surgery aspect of our missions in that we receive donated medical equipment from area hospitals and doctors that is being updated and no, no longer technology uh, up to date for them to use. And we transport this equipment as well as hospital supplies to the general government run hospitals in Central America, enabling them to give better care to the, the citizens that, that we serve. All of this would not be possible if we did not have the cooperation and hard work of not only all the Lions in preparation before we leave on a mission, but I must mention the support that we have of the host Lions in the other countries. We cross international borders and uh, we need the Lions help in those countries to clear customs for the items that we're sending to them to help support our mission and to be used in their hospitals. Uh, they also help us with in-country travel. They help prepare meals for us daily so that we can keep our rigorous schedule of working 10 to 12 hours a day to meet the needs of the people that they ha have helped us uh, with their PR efforts in, in having us ready to examine. Let me give you some of the results of a typical mission that we experience each and every time, which is nearly every year that we go on a trip. With that team of five optometrists, we have kind of a unique philosophy that was started by our founder, Dr. Kruby, that I mentioned a few minutes ago. And that philosophy is we don't only want to give a pair of recycled eyeglasses to the recipient, but we want to give as complete an eye exam as we can. In doing that, many times we discover uh, treatable eye disorders. Some of those eye disorders require the attention of our ophthalmologists. We can further refer those immediately to ophthalmology which is part of our mission, and many times a surgical option is scheduled immediately. That impacts lives immediately while we're there. Two of the best jobs that I can think of that, one of which I've already mentioned, is fitting of the eyeglasses on a person and seeing their response, or having that person tell you after you remove a surgery patch, the day after removing a cataract surgery, which we nearly do 200 of them each and every mission with our ophthalmology teams that we're talking about. Seeing that person say to us in Spanish, thank you for giving me my sight back, and that grandmother is holding her grandchild's hand, and she's never been able to see the face of that grandchild. Many of you in this room are grandparents. Think what that experience would be like. Many of you are also wearing eyeglasses. Think how your day would be changed if I ask you to remove your glasses and try to function normally without your glasses on a typical day. These are the needs that we address on our missions. We're proud to be Lions. I'm proud to accept this recognition as a champion of change on behalf of not only our mission group members, that have participated for over 30 years on these eye care missions internationally, but the other Lions groups throughout the country that also provide eyeglass missions to other countries and have similar results to ours. It's a pure pleasure to be with you today and represent each of those groups that continue the work and the challenge of, Lion, of, of Helen Keller so many decades ago. We are indeed the modern day knights in the crusade against blindness, and I'm very happy to be part of that crusade. Well, thank you all. That, that, that was really, it, it's all very humbling. Um,
your uh, all your great work, and I want to be respectful of our time, but so I, I, if we have time, I'd like to ask you each kind of the same question, which is, what's been your biggest challenge um, in your work on behalf of, of Lions? And it's really two parts. What's been your biggest challenge, and um, what's been the biggest surprise um, when you started this work over time uh, uh, that you encountered? So, um, Brad, could you uh, talk to that a little bit? Well, the biggest challenge, I think, for almost all of us is uh, fundraising uh, because we can do so much work. You, you know, if you have more money, you can do more work. In fact, we at Mid-South Lions currently have a waiting list of about 200 people just because the, the need is so great. Uh, it's not that we're not doing a lot of good work. We're still doing 300 surgeries, 400 surgeries a year, but we're just challenged because the need is so great that we just can't raise money fast enough to, uh, to offset the need. And so uh, I think that's the biggest challenge is uh, for us to continue to try to make people aware of what we're doing, tell the stories that these people uh, share today with the public so that uh, I think people will be more generous if they know the Lion story. And thank you to the White House and to this group for allowing us to, to be public with this and so people can see our story and hear our stories and maybe perhaps uh, be more generous so that uh, we can do more work. Now the biggest surprise, the biggest surprise I think I had was when I went to work at Mid-South Lions about 22 years ago, I thought I'd be there six months. Because <laughs> I worked at a university and I thought, well, I'll get another, another school job. And, but because of what we do as Lions, and because of a, an incident that happened at, uh, at the Missouri Lions State Convention, when a nurse got in front of us and she said, you know, I begged and begged and prayed that God would send me an angel to take care of my eyesight so I could go back to work and so I could take care of my family, but he refused to send an angel. Instead, he sent the lions. Thanks. Um, the biggest challenge has been to get um, eye care professionals to step out of their comfort zone and to volunteer the first time. Once they volunteer the first time, we call them lifers, because they receive the gratification. For many reasons, people with uh, special needs really remind us of our common humanity. And once you volunteer that first time, you get it. But you know, some people just want to be on the golf course you know, on the weekend. But there, there's, and I'm not trying to make one thing better than the other, but I know you can kind of do it all. And, and if my colleagues would just step out of that comfort zone, come the first time, realize the amount of gratification. Because every lion knows. So it's really something just that's a big challenge. But uh, we're finding it to be less and less. Also trying to get the new generation. It's really been great with the Special Olympics Lions Club International Organized Program. Because we have partnership with the Optometry School in the United States. So as part of their training, they volunteer for the program. And then when they get out, they, they continue to become volunteers and they're actually the second generation of people who did it as students and now become And my, and my biggest surprise is what it's became. From an isolated good idea, idea Sasha Driver said to me 20 years ago, tell me what to do to make people with intellectual disabilities see me. And this is the guy who found the school. And I was, I was humbled that I came up with this plan. And I never thought that it would grow. But if you have a plan, the advantage of being third is I only have to repeat two things. <laughs> uh, one big challenge, like Brad mentioned, was uh, getting the money to do this. And the Lions of uh, Maryland, Delaware, and District of Columbia have uh, raised nearly six million dollars to support this program and are continuing to raise money to put into it. But that's not the only role they've played. They've been very active in the education role, they've been very active in community service and helping people with visual impairments, and, uh, and now getting very active in another program uh, to actually provide direct service to some of the people, visually impaired citizens of the community who need this assistance. Another big challenge, as Paul mentioned, is we're trying to change how healthcare is delivered in this area, which uh, 
change is always difficult for uh, people who have a system uh, to accept, and and so it's it's been challenging to 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 get uh, practitioners to change their behaviors, and of course uh, uh, healthcare funding has been changing over the years, so to, to keep up with those kinds of uh, changes uh, and adapt the program uh, so that we continue to get patients covered. The uh, uh, surprise, well, let me add one more challenge, is, is just the sheer magnitude of the problem. When we started, about three and a half million people uh, had low vision, and uh, about 80 percent of those are over age 65. Uh, now with the tidal wave of baby boomers entering into the age uh, when they get these age-related eye diseases, uh, we're up to about five million now, and over the next 20 years that number is expected to double. And so th the big challenge now is service delivery getting enough service providers, uh, providing these services that are needed. Uh, we're beginning to believe that the best place to provide these services is in the patient's home and uh, in the community and so that they can generalize what they're learning to, to the situation they're, they're living in every day. And so there'll be a number of challenges along those way. The surprise has been uh, how things have changed. That the National Institutes of Health, especially National Eye Institute, has made low vision a high priority for research and development. And uh, uh, in fact, one of the programs even has low vision in its title now. And uh, when I started this, uh, I'm an academic, and low vision was considered academic death if you were to, to go into this field. But, uh, but all of that has changed. Uh, as I mentioned, Medicare has changed their policies to uh, recognize the services provided to low vision patients are medically necessary and should be covered. Uh, not everything is, is there yet, but uh, that uh, has been a change. So I've been surprised at how things can change in addition to uh, the, the challenges. Thank you. The biggest challenge I think is uh, for us is managing the time. As you all know, we are busy individuals who are working, we are parents, we are doing so many things. But then uh, the, the thing that enables us to be able to do what we want to do is by working together, by delegating some of the things, by you know stepping up, other people will step up when you cannot do something, and it just happens. And uh, I guess another challenge is how to be able to communicate what you want to the community and what you need from the community people, especially the other organizations. But once they're, they see what you're doing, they are the ones who are going to, to uh, help you out and even help you with funding and giving donations with what you have, with, with the things that you're doing. And um, as a club, we started with no funds at all. So what we do is just bring food or bring the things that we can bring. And it's uh, amazing and it's surprising how we were able to do it. Sometimes you will think that we cannot, you cannot do what you are wanting to do, especially if you are a small club or if you don't have the resources. But sometimes if you think big, if you believe that you can do something, it will really happen. Like, you know, we don't have much to offer, but uh, by establishing those programs, the people will just come and help you out. And what's very surprising for me is uh, being able to see that the kids realizes the impact of what we do. I never thought that my daughters will uh, charter their own Lions Club. So my oldest one chartered the Houston Baptist University Lions Club, and my other daughter chartered the Leo Club. So. I never realized that what we're doing is giving them something, you know, that they are able to feel the joy of giving as well. And another surprise, you know, that charter club became the most outstanding Lions Club in the campus. And just last year, our Leo Club got the uh, Club Excellence Award. And I'm very proud about that. And. Um, to be here tonight, to be here this afternoon is quite um, an honor for me to be able to be with great lions like you, and hopefully that we will continue on doing good things for the community, especially with the youth. Thank you. I think the 
that our biggest challenge is the connection. I think that so many Lions Clubs often think that they're just alone in the world, that we're serving all alone, and that if we have a project idea, there's really no one to help us. We have to figure it out all by ourselves. And I think connecting is really what we have a hard time with in our clubs. Getting information on different product, projects that clubs can do to the clubs, connecting the community to the club, just what does the club do, getting the information from the community to the club and from the club to the community, connecting clubs with each other, and I think connecting within our clubs. I think that that is another big challenge is that we have a multi-generational club, we have a multi-generational society. And I think sometimes we have a hard time making that connection between the new lions or the would-be lions and our experienced lions. I think sometimes we don't reach out for each other. And I, I think that that connection is the one that, that we need to work on the most, bringing our new lions, the new energy into our club and connecting them with the experience uh, of that we've had in the past. So I'd say that's, I think that's our biggest challenge is that connection, getting everybody involved. And the success and the surprise, I'll tell you, I, I don't think a day goes by where I'm not surprised by what Lions do. I'm always surprised, I'm always amazed. I think every time I hear something and I think, you can't do that. Some club shows me I'm wrong and they can do it. So every time I tend to sit back and go, can't be done, we've never done it, somebody does it. And I think that's the great thing about Lions, is that there's always someone who can do what needs to be done. So I'd say that's the biggest surprise I've had in Lions. Thank you. Greg? We, all the time, are facing three challenges uh, with our international eye care missions. First of all is funding that I mentioned earlier. The Approximately half of our budget of the $12,000 it costs us to fund an annual mission is the cost of a door-to-door -door sea container that we ship from Fort Wayne, Indiana to our destination uh, in Central America. In that container, not only are our supplies for the mission, but those equipment donations that I had outlined for you earlier we somehow have always been able to find the funding, challenge our clubs, put on programs so that they feel the feeling that we have uh, of serving the, with the Lions and the other countries, and they've always come through for us. Another challenge that we have is recruiting sufficient numbers of eye care professionals. We've been very fortunate over the years to be able to partnership with the optometry equivalent of a volunteer organization such as our Lions Clubs International is, and that's known as VOSH, VOSH. Some of you in this room know about VOSH, Volunteer Optometric Service to Humanity. Uh, I'm an Indiana director also of that organization, and with that partnership, we've been able to meet the challenge of staffing our missions with enough optometrists to get the job done. And that's an important partnership that I plan on continuing. The third challenge that we face on an ongoing basis, and you can appreciate this, when I took over the mission in the mid-90s, the uh, warehousing aspect for these donations we were receiving, we had about 800 square feet of warehouse space available to us. Today we have 25,000 square feet of used medical equipment waiting to be shipped to our mission sites. Sometimes we've been able to, to ship multiple containers in one year, but I've already told you what that cost is, which goes back to the fundraising aspect that we are challenged with on an ongoing basis. But the lions always come through for us. And when we put the word out, spread the word of how our work impacts the lives of the people we serve, Lions Clubs are international, and when we share those stories, Lions respond to the challenge. Am I surprised? Yes, I'm surprised at how we've grown over the years. 
We've not tried to control our growth. It's only been limited by our funding potential. But yet I look forward to many more years of, of this effort on our behalf to meet the needs in those countries where the people are not getting proper eye care that we from the United States can provide to them. And it's a true pleasure to continue this work in the name of all lions. Well, thank you all very much. As I said earlier, this is really humbling, and it's also a great comfort. Um, I was on the phone this morning. Uh, one of the things I do is on the phone this morning with the folks from Aurora, Colorado, trying to help them kind of deal with uh, the tragedy that they had out there. To, to be able to come to an event like this, to be among all of you and to listen to these stories and all the work that you do, um, is something I'll take back to the office. And as I said, uh, Secretary Duncan, the President, uh, couldn't be more grateful for the work that you do in your communities every day. Um, it's clear. These, these stories are, uh, uh, are, are just um, you know, incredible and um, couldn't, be, uh, couldn't express our appreciation and thanks to all of you and to all of you. And um, let's give our panel one more. Thank you. Yeah, um, just one other group that we haven't thanked, uh, and on behalf of the other co-champions, I'd really like to thank the Lions staff, who have been really, really great in holding our hands and getting us through this. We're very blessed to have them. Thank you. the champions please stand up again if we give them a round of applause what do we think about that you know the champions we've recognized today and the 1.35 million lions around the world that they represent are truly uh, lions of change, agents of change. Why? Because they've helped remove hurdles, they've changed the lives of others, they've given others the chance to see again, they've given others the chance at an education, they've helped rebuild their communities, they've helped rebuild lives, and yes, they have become lions of, and champions of change in their own rights. We are really honored to have been invited to this White House today to participate in this championship event. And on behalf of Lions International, President Wayne Madden and the Lions from over 207 countries around the world, I'd like to thank the White House staff, especially Victoria McCullough, for an outstanding job today. And her staff at the Office of Public Engagement have just been wonderful to work with as have our moderators. I really thank them for all they've done today. And I truly want to thank all you, the Lions from around the world that have attended this wonderful event. This concludes the official portion of the day, a day which we've recognized some outstanding Lions and participated in some informative discussions on the importance of community service and the value of giving back to the community and gained some interesting perspectives on issues that many of you in this room, in your communities are facing. So once again, thank you.